If you have an unquenchable thirst to crush your bucket list, relentlessly pursue your dreams, and live life on your own terms, then turn up the volume and tune in. You're now listening to Zeph and Moses Blacksburg on the Year of Purpose podcast. Zeph and Blacksburg here with another round of the Year of Purpose podcast, and today I'm joined by Emily Moberly, and Emily is the founder and executive director of Traveling Stories, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to outsmarting poverty one book at a time. Since 2010, Emily and her team have established international libraries in El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, South Sudan, and the Philippines, and one literacy program in San Diego. She created a Reading is Sexy merchandise line that so far has sold in more than 41 states and 12 countries. And next, she will, be, she will begin offering Traveling Stories social franchises for those who want to start a library or story tent program but don't want the trouble of starting their own nonprofit. Just months after Forbes magazine called her one of the top 10 female entrepreneurs to watch in San Diego, she was nominated for the San Diego Business Journal's Women Who Mean Business Award. She's been invited to share her story at universities across the U.S., and today she's going to share her story with us. What's going on? Uh, Not much. Just excited to be here. Yeah, so I met you through another person we interviewed on the podcast, so Colby from The Job Hunter, and basically when we first started talking, uh, there was this person walking around in the background of of the episode, and I was like, oh, who's that? And he told me what you were doing, and I was like, oh my god, like we definitely need to talk because it sounds like you really found something purposeful and meaningful in your life and really chased yeah. after it. So I'd love for you to explain, you know, just a little bit more about what Traveling Stories is and then maybe we'll dive into, you know, how it all got started. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Traveling Stories is a nonprofit, like you said, and our goal is to help kids um, fall in love with reading and to help them become confident readers and also to provide access to books in places where kids don't have books. Um, and that's kind of where it all started. I don't know about you, but I like love reading. And as a child, some of my favorite moments um, were just you know being tucked in. My mom would read to me every night. I always saw my parents reading. My best friend growing up was Nancy Drew. It took me a long time to say that without being embarrassed. <laughs> um, and something that I, so in when I left college, I I moved to Central America, and that was the first time that I realized that kids didn't have that same experience that a lot of kids in the world were growing up without access to books um and because books had played such a big part of my life growing up I just I like I was honestly really shocked like I couldn't imagine being 15 and never you know reading Dr. Seuss or never falling in love with Nancy Drew or never having a best friend in a book or having that experience where you can escape you know everything going on and and explore a new world when I was a kid I I had and my parents are awesome, my family's awesome, but I didn't necessarily have like a lot of money. Um, but I never felt like that because through books, you know, I could travel to Africa, I could travel in time, I, you know, had mentors. I had everything that my imagination craved through books. Um, so I think I really took that for granted uh, for most of my life. And then when I realized that it was actually a luxury in places that's when things changed for me. And that's kind of when I started, you know, finding a purpose in my life that that has taken me on this journey. Very so. cool. And how many years ago did that start? That was five years ago. Wow. So you yeah. and I are kind of in the same boat. I left college five years ago. And uh, I was I was pretty big with reading growing up. I wasn't the best reader because ultimately we found out I needed glasses like after the longest time because I used to like always fall asleep by like page two or three of the chapter my mom would like find me passed out at three o'clock in the afternoon be like what's wrong with you (laughs) and so but later I I became a better reader once I got glasses but I loved uh the Goosebumps series I had like all hundred and some books and they're just making a movie out of it now so I'm super stoked for that Harold and the Purple Crayon uh where the wild things are so I was a huge fan growing up of all these stories and and Harry Potter like I got totally engulfed by the Harry Potter world when I was younger I'd be that guy waiting in line at midnight to get a book (laughs) and it's amazing yeah it's powerful you can go into a whole other world and 
so it's it's really interesting to hear from you how uh, your life has kind of mirrored that that story of the book of, of entering another world as you really entered yeah. another world when you traveled to another country. Totally. Yeah. And so it, it's we don't realize how good we have it until we mm -hmm. see, you know, somebody else who doesn't have what we have. And Definitely. it's really cool that you found this opportunity. So what what did you go to college for and did it have any relation to like you know why that's, you chose to travel that's a really great question and i think part of it kind of has to do so when i was in high school backing up a little bit farther when i was in high school one of my mentors challenged me and said never make a decision out of fear and i thought that was huge for me because surprisingly as a kid like I hate my parents would drag me to Mexico we would go visit orphanages we'd like do all these things that I was very uncomfortable doing and so in high school it sort of started to click and when my mentor said never make a decision out of fear I started realizing that a lot of the things I had been doing in my life um, I had making I had been making decisions out of fear um, fear of being uncomfortable fear of the unknown fear of not having a bathroom you know whatever and so I went to college in Arkansas which I'm from San Diego so that was kind of a big step for me to leave California leave my family go to Arkansas where I didn't know anyone I didn't know the culture um, but once again you know that was making a decision not letting fear dictate my decision um, then I ended up studying journalism which was kind of more my passion I wanted to write and I wanted to find a way to tell people's stories um, I wanted to hold powers accountable, and my ultimate goal was to be a foreign correspondent for someone like the BBC. Um, I wanted to go to like war torn areas and um, you know find stories of people that that weren't being told and and elevate them and help people find their voice uh, to have power in that way. And um, that led me to Uganda, where I got to study abroad and um, just learn a ton about East African culture and history and literature and and about journalists there covering things. Um, so through all of that, I mean, I think as a child, reading gave me a thirst for adventure. And then once I finally started thinking about fear and the role it played in my life and how I didn't want it to be the deciding factor, that's when I started having real adventures of my own. Um, and I never thought that I would start a nonprofit. Like, I really, really wanted to be a journalist. And now, looking back, I can see how all of those experiences and all those classes really play a role in what I do now with traveling stories. Like, I didn't see it then. I didn't see it wasn't until I was in Central America and I was teaching and my students had no books that I started to remember back to Uganda and realize like, wow, all those kids that I interact with, interacted with also didn't have books. And I don't know, it, it, like all the pieces started coming together. I don't know if that makes sense or not. but Yeah, I mean, you really can't tell until it's already passed you by, you know, so there's no way to look ahead and be like, oh, well, you know, if I decide to eat this pizza today, then, you know, three years from now, this is going to happen. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's part of what I'm learning about my purpose, you know, is I wanted, I thought I knew what I wanted to do. Um, and that changed over time. But what didn't change were my values. So I wanted adventure. I wanted to empower people. I wanted to hold corrupt powers accountable. You know, I wanted to see change in the world. I wanted to make the world a better place. I thought I could do that with journalism. Um, but it turns out I'm able to do it more effectively by giving kids the opportunity to learn how to read and fall in love with reading and be really just empowered, critical thinkers. So I'm not necessarily, you know, writing for a newspaper or telling stories, but I'm giving kids and communities the tools they need to be able to tell their own story, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you also might be enabling them to grow up to be those types of people that do hold the bigger companies yes. accountable. So, yes, you know, yes, yes, that's my goal. Hopefully, because a lot of the kids we're working with, in, we're working with kids internationally, but we're also working with kids locally. And a big part of reading is critical thinking and engaging what you're reading and thinking about it. And it's really exciting to see kids begin to think for themselves and be able to think about how could I make my community better. That way it's not just some random, you know, white girl showing up saying, hey, you need to do this, this, and this to make your community better. It's more like, hey, here's tools that help you think more creatively. 
let's invest in your imagination. And then what problems do you see around you and how can you as a community derive a solution, if that makes sense? Yeah, so very cool. So you're not just giving someone a book and saying, all right, see ya, like have fun. (laughs) No, yeah, I mean, my hope is, and I mean, that's the thing that kind of is cool for me personally is like I wouldn't be who I am if it weren't for books. Like I've had a lot of different jobs over the years. I've had a lot of experiences and most of that has come because I was able to read and train myself and educate myself. And to be able to share that love and share that opportunity with with kids all over the world is, I mean, it's so rewarding. Yeah. No, that's really awesome. And and so where does the story of traveling stories begin? Like once you kind of, at some point you made your way back home from traveling international yeah. because you're definitely not overseas right now. Um, so where does where does it all begin here? And, and what sort of obstacles do you yeah. have in, in making a nonprofit? That's a great question. So I still didn't, I came back from Honduras. And I got a job at a magazine, still pursuing journalism a little. I didn't want to start a nonprofit. I wanted to take trips every year and be that weird book lady and just like bring books and read with children and have a good time. Um, but as I shared stories with my friends and you know people in my community in San Diego, they were insistent. They were like, no, you need to do more because we want to be part of this. And I was like, oh, okay. So... I did a bunch of research. I was lucky enough to connect with people who knew how to start a nonprofit and for some reason wanted to help me for free. Um, They told me to read, you know, like starting a nonprofit for dummies or whatever. And so I was, you know, doing all this research and my due diligence and I found out how much it would cost to start a nonprofit without a lawyer. And so then I sent a Facebook message to everyone who had been bugging me. There was probably like 60 people. And I said, here's the deal. You know, you guys have said I should start this nonprofit. Um, Here's how much it's going to cost. And I said, I don't want to start a nonprofit that's all about me. I don't want it to be the Emily show. Um, I want to know that the community is involved and I want to know that I have support. So I said, if you guys raise the money, then I'll commit my time and I will make sure that this becomes a success. And I didn't know if we would, you know, I was like, whatever, we'll see what happens. Within five days, we had raised all the money. And so I was like, oh, okay. I'm stuck. Um, But then, you know, it turned into this amazing, amazing thing. And it sounds like I didn't want to do it. That's not true. I just was, I knew it was going to be overwhelming. I knew I didn't know how to run a nonprofit. I didn't know how to start libraries or how to teach kids how to read necessarily. Um, So, so that was exciting. And, you know, I, those people are still supporting now, which is amazing. So five years later, they're still involved and our support base has obviously grown. But the challenges, I think, um, you know, in the first place, just the normal challenges, the paperwork, the fundraising, all of that. But I think more than that, I struggled and continue to struggle just being a woman who looks young. I'm 29, but I probably look like I'm 25 sometimes. And I tend to be pretty enthusiastic and smiley, which I think makes people think that I'm younger and not as experienced. Um, so I really struggle with being taken seriously. And I think everyone who starts a venture struggles with that, whether they're a man or woman. Um, but you know, the first couple of years people looked at me and they just saw this naive, idealistic person. Um, and they thought I would quit. So I think a lot of people didn't want to donate until they saw my track record. So there was a lot of pressure when I first started to really impact as many kids as possible, do as much as possible. Meanwhile, I had no resources. (laughs) Um, so so that was challenging. And this whole time, uh, up until April, I've had at least one other job. So until this April, Traveling Stories has been what I do in nights and weekends. So that in and of itself is a challenge too. You know, I think a lot of times you people want to start something because it sounds really glamorous. And then it gets really hard. And it's really tempting to give up. Um, luckily for me, I have some stories about kids from the very beginning whose lives have changed. And so whenever I felt like giving up, I would just think about those kids and think about how much joy I felt. Um, and that encouraged me to keep going. And and luckily those stories also compelled other people to get involved. But, you know, I think, I think just getting people to take me serious and to trust that I was legit and that I wasn't going to quit 
um, <laughs> too legit to quit. <laughs> I, think, I think that was a big part. Um, you know, just people, I mean, people spend their money, everyone wants people's money. And so why is my cause any more important than someone else's? So learning how to communicate that to people, but also learning to have confidence myself, you know, like that's something that I still struggle with. So yeah. I love this episode so far, and I want to take a brief moment to talk about improving yourself each day. I know you are a huge fan of living life on your own terms, but if there's one thing I've learned in my journey, we need to constantly grow and look to others who have been in our shoes, which is why I've partnered up with Audible to give you one free download of your choice from over 180,000 books. Start your free 30-day trial by visiting yearofpurpose.com slash audible. Now back to the show. It, it doesn't sound like you disliked the process of making the nonprofit. I think that you realized that it was a huge undertaking and mm-hmm. that, you know, you're still, you were very passionate about it. And as soon as that showed to everyone around you, that's when they really were like, all right, well, we're going to step in and support you in it. So I don't think it was that you disliked the process, but we got to be real. I mean, it, it's yeah. not an easy process by any means. And so, no. yeah. At all. And I think a lot of times, like, People expect results quickly, and at least with starting a nonprofit, especially when you are relying on volunteers, I had to really um, re- like change my expectations. So, you know, I, I would want to see results. I would want to get our nonprofit status immediately, but it took nine months. And so, I think I started to approach this more as a marathon um, and less like a sprint. And once I switched that in my head it became much easier. I realized, okay, I don't have to change the world or fix illiteracy, you know, by the end of this year. I need to do it. I need to build something that's going to last a long time. I need to invest in a strong structure. And I don't need to meet people who are going to become a giant donor immediately. You know, I want to develop relationships. I want people to get to know me and get to know our, our program and grow with us. And that, I think that took a lot of pressure off and really helped you know, helped everyone feel more relaxed and be able to be authentic as opposed to sales pitchy, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I can definitely resonate with the whole like being young thing, you know, I'm 26. And like, if I don't shave, and I'm not wearing my glasses, I look like I'm 15 years old. And so like, (laughs) I get carded everywhere that I go. And it's like, I I get the same thing, you know, I I run a business and I work with clients on a daily basis and I'm always like the youngest looking guy at the networking events and things like that. Mm So it's, it's definitely a huge barrier is, you know, what people think of you before they've even met you. But to that point, I think, you know, if you're passionate enough about what you're doing and ambitious enough and it really shows outwards, then I I don't think people really question whether or not they want to work with you. It's just kind of a matter of when instead of a matter of if. I think you're right, and that's one thing, um, as people, you know, you can't really control, well, you can influence a first impression, but I think hard work, like, my board of directors right now is amazing, and I think one of the reasons, if you ask them why they're on my board, I think they would say they saw how hard I worked, and I didn't expect people to do things for me. You know, I wanted to build a library in South Sudan, the world's newest country, and so I went and I did it. You know, I hired somebody. I hired a guard with an AK-47 to sit on a box of books and drive them from Uganda to South Sudan. And, you know, I think, I think if you, like you said, if you're ambitious and you are focused on your goal and then you're not scared to work hard, that's going to attract people no matter how old you are or how experienced you are. Yeah, absolutely. And so you, you've built a pretty cool organization so far. You've been working on it for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, I guess the question comes up, you know, because so many people want to know how they uh, profit off of off of their passion. Um, tell yeah. me a little bit about just, you know, what you've had to do. It, it sounds like there's been some jobs involved on the side and things yeah. like that. So how has that balance worked out for you um, just with like between working both for the nonprofit and for yourself? It's been really challenging, but I think personally it's been very good. So I started the nonprofit in 2010 and I was working full time and I at that point you know I I wanted traveling stories to grow but I wasn't sure I wanted it to be my career I was thinking perhaps I'd hire somebody maybe I would just be involved in the parts I loved Um, and traveling stories naturally just grew obviously I worked super hard on it because I you know I wanted it to be successful and I had made a promise to all those first donors Um, 
but really what happened, well, and then after that, I got a job in finance. Um, and traveling stories continued to grow, grow, grow. Like we were having more libraries, we were having more story tents, we were having more donors, more events. It was taking more time. So I was working 40 to 50 hours at my job job, the one that paid me money. And then I was working another 30 or 40 hours on traveling stories. So eventually it just became to a point where I was just so exhausted. Um, but the, the crazy thing is I would be so exhausted, but I would want to work on traveling stories. So I started realizing, like, this is what drives me. This is, and that's, I think, where I really started to see, wow, this is my purpose. Um, and that's when I quit my full-time job and took a leap of faith. And it was super scary because I didn't know, you know, if I would be able to make ends meet. Um, but I think that also inspired, you know, people to step up. And so we attracted some people who made larger donations with a nonprofit. I think it's a little tricky because we're not necessarily selling a product. We're not necessarily providing a service to people who are paying for the service. Um, you know, we're really relying on donors, on grants, on, um, events, things like that. Um, so honestly, like I just feel really, really lucky that I'm now getting paid and I only have one job traveling stories. And I, Honest, I feel like it's just luck. I mean, granted, it's been a lot of hard work. It's been collecting really good board members. It's been filling out a ton of grant applications. You know, we probably have filled out hundreds and only gotten like four. But I don't know if that, I don't really know. It's a hard question for me to answer. It's been a really tough road, and I feel so lucky that I only have this one job. It feels like a dream come true. It feels like it could be taken away at any moment. Um, and I think right now what we're doing is, as a team, we're really focusing on how do we almost productize our programs in a way that is appealing to corporate social responsibility departments, and how do we convince people to partner with us long term? And part of that is making people aware of the problem. So illiteracy in the U.S. is ridiculously just underrepresented. It's it's a really big issue that people don't know about. So making that people making people more aware of that. And then making it more appealing for corporations, especially, to give us money <laughs> yeah. to, to provide that solution. So that's the direction we're heading. And I think, um, I think a lot of people think that there isn't enough money to go around, and I disagree. I think there is enough money to go around, but I think you have to be smart and strategic. And I think you have to have a good program, you know? So yeah. that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of where we're at, and that's kind of how we got here. Yeah. Do you would you say that your your amount of luck directly correlates to the amount of hard work that you put in? Um, Cuz you call yourself lucky, but it sounds like you worked really hard for it. Yes, but I mean, yeah, okay, I would say it directly correlates to my hard work. But I think too, I mean, there's just like I know my mom prays for me every day. I know I have, you know, a team of other people who pray. Um, so I think partially it's hard work, but I think partially it's just you know, I don't know. I like to think it's luck. I, I don't think it's all just hard work, but I have definitely worked very hard. So yeah. if that's it, then awesome. And if that's it, then that means anyone can do it, which I do believe. And that's one reason why I love what I do with Traveling Stories, because I'm working with all these kids who, when I first meet them, they don't know what they want to be when they grow up. They, you know, the only the only role models they have are the people in their small community which are usually low-income communities. But after they come to our program week after week and they interact with these volunteers who are doctors, they're, um, they're moms, they're, what, you know, they're all these different people, their worldview is, is uh, enlarged in such a huge way. And I feel like I'm a living example that being able to read and being willing to work hard can literally take you wherever you want to go. And so that's what I hope the kids who come to our program take away because they literally I believe I believe every person can, can be whatever they want to be um if they're willing to work for it yeah that that's a pretty cool way to go about it I mean I 100% agree with you I think that everyone can you know look at where they are currently and look at where they'd like to go and really figure out the in-between and what it takes to get there um, you know, I always share the story of when I was getting ready to quit my job, I had no clue how I would make up $30,000 a year. 
And someone yep. really broke it down and said, well, how much would you have to make in a day? Not not a year, but in a day. And it was like yeah. $83. And I was like, really? Like 80 bucks in a, in a day? Yeah. Like I, I could figure that out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's so, doable. It, it's so doable. And, and yeah. Oh, go ahead. It, it goes back to, to the whole making a decision out of fear. You know, like if the only thing – once you realize the only thing keeping you from quitting that job is fear, then it's easier to be like, okay, well, I don't want fear to rule my life. I want myself to rule my life. I want my dreams to rule my life. I want my aspirations and my ambitions. And then having faith in yourself, you know, you know, you can, you did it, you know, you can do it. I did it somehow with help and hard work. Um, and I think all of that is, I mean, a lot of times people look at traveling stories and they just see it as a book thing or a literacy thing but it it's what we've been talking about it's so much more than that you know it's inspiring people and empowering it's empowering kids to be the best they can be it's believing in them when no one else does and it's giving them the tools they need to make their goals happen yeah well i think you definitely need to open up an east coast office over here because baltimore is actually known as the city that reads and so you should definitely be taking advantage of that um, I think you have a great thing going there. I'm curious to hear what what do you see five years from now? Like where where how about where would you like to be personally, and then like where would you mm. like the organization to be? Yeah, that's that's so much fun to think about. Um, I five years from now, I would love Traveling Stories to be a national organization. Um, right now we're involved in California, but there is such a great need. Uh, for literacy support in communities across the U.S. Like over two-thirds of fourth graders in our country cannot read at grade level, which I find ridiculous. So I would like to be, uh, a ma- I'd like to play a major role in changing that. I'd like Traveling Stories to be a leader when it comes to improving grade level reading among kids in America. I'd like to have our story tents in communities all across the U.S. Um, I'd like to focus on that between now and the next five years. I'd like to continue to support our international libraries, but I'd like to focus more effort here in America. Um, Because when I think about it, you know, if we're empowering kids here to not only value reading more, but become more competent and more confident readers, they could turn into ambassadors who can, you know, share their love of reading with kids internationally. Um, Personally, I would like to be doing less admin and less of the nitty gritty. Um, I'd like to have a team. It looks like we're going to hire our first part-time uh, employee nice. next month, which is a huge deal. So I'd like to turn. Um, I'd like to grow our team. I'd like to have at least a couple people on staff um, so that I can be more involved in like speaking and and just kind of training and working with our partners all across the U.S. and all across the world. Um, and I'd like to write a book. And I would like to continue to learn and position myself as kind of an expert um, on literacy, on especially literacy among uh, preschool to third grade children. So I feel like nowadays, I mean, this might be mean to say, but I feel like there's a lot of conferences that talk about education and about literacy in the U.S., but most of them are represented by older librarian types. Um, and I think there's a real... There's a real, there's a space for somebody younger and more enthusiastic and a little bit crazy, and I would like to take that place. So. Well, I think you kind of have to be a little bit crazy to, you know, be willing Definitely. to quit your job and start a nonprofit and, you know, Definitely. help people across the world. But I, I admire it, and you know, congrats to you for everything Thank that you have built over the last few years. And um, it's been really great chatting with you. I'd love to share with everybody listening in, you know, where's the best way to keep track of, uh, what's going on with traveling stories and, and how can they help out? Thank you for asking. Um, the best way would probably be to follow us on Facebook. That's where we post the most updates. So that's facebook.com slash traveling stories. Uh, the other best place would be our website, which is travelingstories.org. Um, you can find information about starting a story tent, volunteering, of course, donating. Um, I'd like to point out, too, everyone always wants to know how much money goes directly to the programs. And at Traveling Stories, at least 92 cents of every dollar goes directly toward helping kids become great readers. 
Um, so that's something we're super proud of. But yeah, our Facebook page or our website are the best way to reach us. Good deal. Well, thanks for spending some time with me today. And, you know, for everyone listening, if you're interested, definitely check out those websites. And uh, I guess we'll be catching up with you again here very soon. Awesome. Thanks for the time and thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Year of Purpose podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to leave us a rating and review if you loved this episode. Now, are you ready to live life on your own terms? Head on over to www.yearofpurpose.com right now for the tools, resources, and the roadmap to living a life rescripted. And tune in next week for another episode of the Year of Purpose.